Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. I'm doing great. I'm excited today because I get to hang out with a guy who kind of accidentally bought one of the coolest pieces of wrestling memorabilia in the world, and it's pretty much changed his life in every way since. We're gonna see that item, hear his story, and I think you're gonna love it. It's a little Nature Boy Ric Flair coming at you today. Woo! Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, yeah, this is, um, but I guess you can edit whatever you want to edit later. But yeah, that's my stuff there. So that's the bandana he gave me after his match when I repped him whatever year that was. That is so cool. What a, uh, that, that's not even what we came to see, but that's a perfect starter. <laughs> yeah. I love the old, this one especially, this is, uh, I love the old Wahoo McDaniel stories and then I got to be pals with Roddy for like the last two years of his life, so yeah. that's, and it was at the Cincinnati Garden, I mean, I'm from Dayton area, so that's really okay, cool. Okay, so you're from Ohio, right? Yeah. Okay. This is actually my favorite one, right here, because it's actually from Greenville. Oh, yeah. And Flair and Steamboat, 1977, that one is. Ricky Steamboat's gym jacket signed. Bobby Heenan's ring worn jacket. Well, my friend here, Wes Potter, this is a, it's a true honor that you've invited me out to see one of, like I introduced in the, uh, the opening of the video, maybe the most iconic piece or one of the most iconic pieces of wrestling memorabilia in the world, Ric Flair's robe. Tell me the significance of this robe. In the wrestling community, I would say. Yeah, um, I don't know that you can overstate it. Um, it's uh, probably his most recognizable robe, I would think. It's, uh, you know, been seen in clips now for years all over the world from, you know, obviously WWE content to ESPN, highlight reels. So I feel like we're all sort of familiar with the visual of what it is. Who has he worn this to the ring against, just to give people an oh idea? Oh my gosh, like, you know... This is dated back, I've seen a picture as old as 1978. So undoubtedly, you know, we're throwing um, probably Jack Briscoe in the mix by that point. Uh, probably Dory Funk at that time. Obviously, Dusty, Harley Race, uh, probably even Steamboat in some of those shows that aren't as famous as the trilogy from 89, but this was like his go-to during that period. And so he actually wore this to the ring for his first three world championship wins so, wow yeah who are those against so let's see if we're testing my history here i think it's 81 was dusty i believe right and then of course 83 in november of 83 starcade 83 the first wrestling pay-per-view uh, that's probably what it's most known for against harley race where flair won the title for the second time and then um he actually wore it to japan I believe in 84, maybe, when he and Kerry Von Eric traded uh, the title back and forth in Japan. So uh, it's been there for the first three of, you know, his 16 world titles. So, I mean, that's that's pretty significant. Now, you and I are the same age. We have the same love of baseball. We have the same love of wrestling. And it blew me away to find out that you ended up getting this robe, purchasing this robe yourself, when you were still a teenager. You were still in high school. Can you tell us this story? So I can, uh, and you might edit this out, but we're the same age, but I'm definitely better looking. So that's a, that's a <laughs> we will edit that out. But uh, yeah, so same age. Um, and when I was in high school, I was a huge baseball fan and baseball cards and collectibles at that time were really big. So I'd buy and sell cards at school. And I've done that for years in middle school and high school. And so I'd saved up uh, a decent amount of money. It was burning a hole in my pocket. And I was originally gonna buy a uh, 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle card. Uh, number 311 so if you're a baseball collector or guy you know that card it's an iconic card rookie card yeah it's uh probably as iconic in baseball cards as this is you know yeah. wrestling fans so i was gonna spend my money on that i got outbid uh at the last second on uh, what at the time was a new auction site called ebay and uh, got outbid didn't get the mickey mantle card i still had the money i had to have something it was just burning a hole in my pocket i was 16 17 and uh, i was actually able to come across uh, a listing on eBay and though it doesn't sound as impressive in 2024 to say you bought this on eBay if we go back to 97 98 when eBay's just starting you put in Ric Flair you got like 70 returned items and that's it 
Now when you do it, you get like 8,000. So yeah. it was very obscure, upstart site. I came across a Ric Flair, spelled R-I-C-K, uh, and the owner had listed it as Ric Flair Wrestling Cape. And so I saw it. I immediately recognized it as genuine. I was like, wow, this is would be a cool novelty toy item, right, to kind of have. And so I ended up winning the auction on the robe on eBay. I didn't quite fully understand just how historically significant it was at the time. Uh, kind of learned that after the fact because I didn't necessarily grow up a wrestling fan. But definitely loved Ric Flair and loved uh, you know his persona, everything about him. And so I knew I had something special. I just didn't quite know how special just yet. Now you asked the seller like what the story of how they got it was. That was pretty cool. Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm in North Carolina. The road was all the way out in Denver, Colorado. And so I messaged the owner. You know, I think the obvious question is, like, how did you get this? You know, like, why doesn't Ric Flair have this in 1999? Like, we didn't know about this. Or even how do you know it's real? How What's, do you even know it's real? Yeah. How did you get all the way out there? How do you have it? Oh, just tons of questions. So I asked the owner, how did you get it? So owner originally lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and they had moved from Charlotte to Colorado. And uh, while in Charlotte, they attended a charity auction that Flair had actually donated this robe to. So I'm thinking, you know, he may have kept it for a few years after he stopped wearing it, and then probably sometime in the 90s donated it to a charity auction. Yeah, because you, you point out to me, like, little pieces are kind of falling off or that we're masking tape. In those days, not think of a collector's market. He might have been going, this thing's pretty much junk, but let's see, let them get what they can get for it. Who knows? Yeah, pretty much. I don't think he ever would have wore it again, right? Because um, he did donate other robes. Like Darius Rucker said, that's how he got his robe yeah, from a charity auction. And I remember um, during the uh, Owen Hart uh, tribute show that OVW did where uh, Brian Danielson and William Regal wrestled the main event, he donated a robe for that. So that's pretty common. Yeah. So they, they bid on it in this charity auction. The guy said he had had a little bit to drink, started feeling good. Uh, thought a robe would be cool, so he buys it. Um, you know, over the course of the next couple of days, he gets home, the hangover's worn off, the wife is on him, like, why did you buy this stupid thing? I can't believe <laughs> you spent money on this. And once the novelty's kind of gone, they packed it up in a box in Charlotte, kept it in their attic. Uh, after a few years of having it up there, they moved from Charlotte to Colorado, and it still stayed in the attic in Colorado. Uh, then they were moving homes in Colorado from one location to another. That's when they they go upstairs, they're going through the boxes, and they discover the long forgotten robe, and they pull it out, they're like, what is this? The wife says, you know, it's that stupid cape you bought when we lived back in Charlotte, we need to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> so they're moving houses in Colorado and decide that uh, they're gonna have a yard sale, right? Or a tag sale, I think some folks call them. And so they actually take the robe, they put it on a table outside in their front yard for sale, for fifteen dollars, uh, oh. fifteen bucks, and then nobody buys it. Wow. So that's that's even more astounding. Yeah, right? you were thinking he'd be the guy that was the fifteen dollar buyer, but yeah, nobody buys. No, nobody buys it. Uh, so they end up packing it back up. They have a friend there helping them move. He's got a pickup truck, and they start throwing stuff in the pickup truck. They're going to take to the dump and throw it away. His buddy happens to open the box. Sees all this shiny stuff and goes, what's this? And his friend tells him, yeah, when we lived back in Charlotte, you know, the wrestler Ric Flair, we bought this cape at an auction and we couldn't sell it today at the yard sale, 15 bucks, so we're going to throw it away. So then his buddy intercedes and says, there's this new website and it's called eBay. It's like a yard sale online. I've got an account there. I can maybe try to help sell it for you there. Yeah. So the guy says, yeah, hey, sure, try it. And so they ended up putting it up and I ended up with it. So I like to think I somewhat indirectly saved it from a yard sale table in the dump, but that's uh, that's the story. And you know what's crazy is you, you told me that you got an astronomical offer as soon as you bought the robe, as soon as you won the auction. And it, considering, you know, we're not gonna tell what you paid, but considering what you paid, it was extremely generous and you saw, you foresaw the Pro, like the history of this to not get rid of it even then. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, with, with the amount I paid, pretty nominal fee. Um, for the time, it was, you know, probably pretty good, accounting for inflation and cost of living now, uh, a pretty nominal fee. But the offer I received was significant, uh, almost immediately, right, which kind of... To uh, say 10 times is not... Um, not 10 times, no, probably. We'd say about 20 times more than yeah. that. I yeah. paid and I, I declined the offer um, 
one because I was just so kind of in awe of owning it. I was like, ah, oh, you know, twenty thousand. But think of the Mickey Mantle card you could have got with it, right? Right. So I mean, I definitely could have gotten a much better condition Mantle for what I, you know, had paid for this with the capture of the profit in between. But uh, not only did I turn it down because I was just in awe over it, I, I now felt some sort of obligation to kind of hold and protect and, and show off and be like a good steward of owning this thing and then it prompted me to learn more about it okay how old is it who did he wear this against why is it so important to yeah to offer and so then i truly started to kind of immerse in the history of it and then fully appreciate and i was very glad i turned down the offer and you did contact olivia walkie you told me about restoring the robe if she could you know i did um because after i got it obviously i could see like some you know kind of blemishes throughout and i didn't really know who to trust to repair it and so um, uh, through someone I knew in wrestling, uh, they put me in touch with Olivia Walker, uh, who's married to, uh, well, was married to Johnny Walker, uh, Mr. Wrestling 2. And I believe he answered the phone the night I called as a 16, 17 year old kid. And he hands the phone to his wife and she, um, you know, goes on to tell me it's actually her birthday that night. And so uh, they're getting ready to go out to dinner, but she said, yeah, I'd love to work on it. I'd be happy to do it. Um, let's get back in touch. Uh, unfortunately, I never did and she passed away maybe about a year or so later. Uh, so it has never been repaired. Those blemishes are still there. They're all original, but I feel like each blemish, each missing sequin, each falling feather is kind of a little minute piece of history that uh, kind of carries a lot of uh, emotion for a lot of folks uh, with it. So I kind of like it in its compromised state as it is. It's never been altered or, or repaired. And I almost feel like, you know, because when you told me you got that astronomical offer and you didn't take it, uh, you kind of followed it up by saying almost everything in my life since has has been kind of involving this robe. And it's been a pretty cool gateway uh, for me could, because the original purchase uh, was really as a fan, you know. I mean, I, I liked wrestling, but I didn't grow up a wrestling fan. I was a sports fan, baseball, collected the baseball cards. Um, I had a sports injury in high school. And while I was rehabbing, my mother purchased a bunch of Coliseum home videotapes for me. And so that's how I started watching wrestling. My parents had watched wrestling. Middle of the Monday Night Wars, I get turned on to Ric Flair and I'm just immediately hooked. I'm like the robes, the tan, the girls, the look, the dress, everything. I was like, this, this guy's just still cool, even at that later age of his career, yeah. right? And so to get this as a fan was really, really cool. Almost immediately after buying it, uh, one of the people that reached out to me that I met for the first time was uh, Charles Robinson. Who, yeah. Uh, you know, little Nate. Little Nate, right? Um, you know from his days in WCW and then has gone on to have a tremendous career. Great referee. Yeah, for the last 20 years. Greatest referee of all time, in my opinion, uh, had reached out. So then I'm kind of fanboy again because now Little Nate is reaching out. And uh, he was really cool. He sent me uh, some autograph photos from Ric Flair that I still have 25 years later. Um, and so we forged a friendship. And from there, as I was getting ready to graduate high school, I decided I wanted to pursue professional wrestling. I wanted to get involved in the business. And so I had no other contacts, no one that I knew. So this robe connected me to Charles Robinson from there. Um, I was given the phone number to a pretty famous North Carolina uh, talent from the Jim Crockett era in Charlotte, uh, George South. So I reached out to George South, and then uh, first time I ever got in a wrestling ring, uh, George South was there um, and definitely uh, sort of indoctrinated me, if you will, in kind of the old school uh, style of uh, wrestling at that time. And so I learned very quickly that I'd never be able to wrestle. Uh, it's just these guys are incredibly tough and incredibly great athletes and I didn't have that aptitude. Uh, so I left there realizing that. Uh, from there, I still had a desire to be in the business, just didn't know what that looked like. Uh, I considered, you know, okay, maybe a ring announcer, maybe uh, just setting up the ring, uh, being a referee popped in my mind. So from there, a local show came to uh, this Eastern North Carolina area. I reached out to that promoter, started setting up chairs, setting up the ring, and got to referee. So really if we back out of that moment now i've been refereeing about 23 years um and have had some wonderful experiences from the wwe treasure show uh on a and e to being featured in several books and publications i've had a chance to work with numerous like of my heroes from harley race dusty rose rick flair in the ring ricky steamboat all of that that even leads you here today to this moment 
really backs out of me getting this into my possession, you know, 23 years ago or whatever. So it, it's for the largest part of my adult life, this has kind of been the, the launching pad for a lot of, you know, the, the great highs that I've had in, in pro wrestling. So It's really cool that you have it as a fan that there's not a uh, there's not a price that can take it away from you and you do occasionally take it to special events or you have at least you said mm -hmm. probably not going to do a lot of that but you have to where you said like people almost are tearing up to see the robe in person it's um, I'm kind of getting goosebumps right now uh, talking about it but yeah I do feel a little bit of an obligation to share it uh, with the wrestling fans particularly here in North Carolina it just seems to have kind of this uh, Crockett so, Promotions yeah, home. Yeah, Jim kinda. Crockett Homestead, right? It's just kind of got this like undertone of like a connection all across the state. And so when I take it out to different events to show it, um, we get a lot of fan support, a lot of great stories. Folks say, hey, I remember watching wrestling at Dorton Arena in Raleigh with my grandma, and she's been dead for 25 years, but she hated Ric Flair. And I remember <laughs> him wearing that robe. So that almost like connects a, uh, not just a family memory, but they come to share that with you. So it's almost like you're a custodian of, you know, the members of this state of North Carolina, their memories. And a guy came up at an event uh, late last year and was literally almost in tears, uh, just being so thankful to be able to see it. He asked, could he touch it? Things like that. So then as, you know, kind of, uh, you think about that on the surface, it, it really it feels like a great responsibility, but it's also like tremendously overwhelming and heartwarming that other people understand just exactly what it is. But for something that, and, and for something that could have been thrown away, almost was thrown away. Could have been in the dump in Colorado. Yep. I love that you had Ric Flair sign it, but we, we were noticing, you said when you first got it, there was like some jagged tears in this and you ask Olivia Walker, or you mentioned it to her, that's very cool, it's like a peacock. And she told you the story to it. I'm not quite sure if it's this side, but all these sequins are all hand applied and they're very nice, neat rows. But kind of right through here is a little bit of distortion in there. And so when I was talking to Olivia Walker about Oh yeah, that, I see exactly, it's like yep. a weird- Yeah, it's been yeah. patched back together. He was in Japan from what I understand. It looks like you can actually see part of the repair right there yeah right there um, he was in japan it got snagged on a guardrail and he took it to a seamstress to have it fixed and as olivia walker said the seamstress botched it up and so that would definitely not be her work because hers was symmetrical and perfect and there's a little blemish there but that's a great part of the story that is incredible to and see her work i mean she applied all these one by one this is not just like some prefab thing she put together right? yeah she she would take months months her and her sister actually helped her at one time and she has her name on the label inside of so, course so so this one actually doesn't have a label oh really uh, it doesn't his earliest robe she did not do that in she she started that later when um, she became sought after yeah when she started doing stuff when she was doing stuff for dusty around this time and harley those don't have tags in them either okay um but when Might she started to get in with like luger and orndorff in the late 80s and 90s yeah. she started popping those tags in that said olivia originals so here it. you can see just a little bit of what wes was saying right up here where this is kind of worn just from use and she was even telling me that uh it's just shocking that rick even kept this because he was such like a uh he was such a stickler for keeping his stuff well or like just throwing watches out the window oh, and yeah. whatever and just That's going true. like hey who knows you know <laughs> like like you can just see like things like this just knowing him and the kind of money he had i'm just surprised he didn't say you know what throw it in the trash because that's what happened to so many so many people's costume from that era they just trashed them one thing i will point out if you see how these rhinestones still sparkle yeah after 40 some years she told me that each rhinestone was an austrian crystal that she hand applied basically if you're familiar with like the swarovski rhinestones yeah. or, or those crystals it's of that quality and she wouldn't use anything else because she said the magnification when it would hit the spotlights was just unbelievable which is true i mean you still see how it shines today and she said that each one back then was around two bucks a piece so if you just think about the number of rhinestones that are all over this i mean that's thousands of bucks right there in just austrian crystals so you also have some of rick's boots what are this i mean we'll go through a little bit of the things you have because you have some great collection 
other than just the uh, row, but what's the story with the Rick boots? Yeah, so these boots um, are actually from the Chi-Town Rumble match in 89 in Chicago uh, during the series with Steamboat. So these are the actual boots he wore. Both of them, too. That's... In, in this match, and there's actually, uh, in that match, rather, there's kind of an interesting story with these boots. So he had two pairs of boots um, that were very, very similar to each other, but there were some subtle differences. So he had this pair that he wore in 89, then he had another pair made. Um, all of his boots were made by a guy named Clifford Macias out of um, Houston, Texas. And Clifford's passed now, but he ordered a couple pairs that were supposed to look close to being the same, but slightly different. So the toes here are black. He had another pair basically where this color scheme was inverted. And so the toes were red and then this part would be black and vice versa and so that's actually the pair he wore a little bit later in 91 when he debuted at the royal rumble that's what I, those are the ones conrad has right so those are no longer in my collection um but the oh way you had those i did have those oh yes. wow you had both wow yep, I, I did have both pairs but here's the way this came about so it's, again it's about the story so I bought these, uh, or I bought two boots um, from a gentleman in Charlotte, probably in 2003. And so the guy tells me, he goes, hey, this is not a pair of boots. And he said, we have two boots. They both look similar, but they're a little different, and they're both for the left feet. So basically, you have a left foot from two different sets of boots. Yeah. <laughs> they just happen to look the same. I said, how'd you get them? He said, well, Ric Flair stayed at my house one night and he had two pairs of boots that were red and black. If you look at them in a hurry at a quick, quick glance, you could see how they'd get mixed up. Yeah. He told the guy, he tossed two boots to him and said, hey, keep, you know, keep these boots. So he gave them to him. He thought it was a full set. Turns out it's two left feet. So I guess Ric Flair left with the other two right yeah, feet. Yeah, nice later, mistake. Later realized it, and you know, who knows how it, what happened Yeah, there. swapped him out. So I've got two left feet, one half of the Royal Rumble boots, and then one half of the Chi-Town Rumble boots in 2003. So then we're going to fast forward about 15, 16 years later. I'm having a conversation with someone, and they go on to tell me, that they have uh, kind of have a pair of Ric Flair's boots. And so I'm confused. I said, what do you mean kind of? And he goes on to say, well, they look like they're the same, but they're two right feet. And so immediately as he says that, my ears perk up. We're at a wrestling event. I was refereeing. And my ears perk up, and I'm like, two right feet. What, do you, what color are these boots is my next question. You knew what color they were. And so he <laughs> goes, uh, yeah, they're red and black. And so I go, really? Now, he did have a couple other pairs of red and black from the 70s, but we're talking 90s, late 80s time frame. And both of the same foot? And Come so on. I'm almost willing to bet, like, there's no way after almost 20 years I'm going to reunite these things. So I stayed on the guy, stayed on the guy. I was eventually able to acquire the two boots that he had. And when I saw them the first time, I knew that's what they were. So then I put together the Royal Rumble boots and then these boots. I've since gotten rid of the Rumble boots, but um, I do obviously still have the Steamboat boots. But yeah, almost 20 years of being separated. You'd never think you'd ever find the mate and just having a spontaneous conversation. You know, I got goosebumps and immediately dialed in on trying to get them. So. Now, speaking of boots, you have, you mentioned you have a history with Harley. You have Harley's boots, special yep. Harley boots, actually. Yep, yep. So, I uh, got a couple things here in this uh, display case, but the boots you're looking at right there are um, the purple boots with the gold crown. They're actually signed uh, Best in Sports Harley Race. And those are the boots with uh, the original laces that he wore at WrestleMania 3 against Junkyard Dog. Wow. So they have a tremendous amount of wear on them. Harley actually had them displayed in Eldon, Missouri at his school for several years until he donated them uh, to support uh, the Iowa Wrestling Museum after a flood, and I was able to get them uh, from that public auction. But I've had those for probably about 15 years. Wow. And then you also have some of beautiful Bobby Eaton's trunks here. Yep. So those I actually got those directly from Bobby, worked with Bobby several times over the years just a great guy and highly underrated heel um but those are his old uh, sort of nwa uh trunks from the 80s he's actually featured on the 88 nwa wonder rama trading card that you're looking at right there uh wearing those tights so that's about as 
original uh, Midnight Express as it gets. So I have those, and then um, of course uh, this is like a centerpiece. Yeah, those um, are signed by the Macho Man. Those are Randy Savage trunks. Um, the stars are worn out a little bit on the back. They actually say uh, Macho Man, and still got the original uh, drawstring inside. Those are K and H original trunks. I believe the tag's still in there as well. Um, and I believe those to be uh, the same trunks that he wore uh, at WrestleMania 3 in the match against Steamboat. So, a um, lot of history there. Which that has to be great for you being a uh, North Carolinian. Steamboat has a lot of history here. Yes, definitely. And then and the, you got Freddie Blassie. Yeah, that's classy Freddie Blassie. Love signed them right there. Yep, he signed those. And there's actually, um, you can see them kind of on the back. There's some blood stains, um, probably from his battles with John Tolos. So those go back to the, the 60s easily. Wow, what a collection, man. Yeah, I've got a, a little bit of everything. I think kind of back there <laughs> in the corner, you see one of Grand Wizard's turbans. Uh, that's one of his original turbans. And then that kind of red and silver vest there uh, that you're looking at uh, belonged to Ricky Morton. And he wore that very early in his career. It's signed on the inside. But uh, what's funny about that is, if you remember the WWE uh, Mid-South, DVD, um, there's a tag team match where they're headed to the ring and a fan actually presents them with handmade costumes as they're on their way to the ring and they open the box and are presented, uh, Ricky and Robert both from uh, Rock and Roll Express, of course, those vests on that DVD. <laughs> That's so, so and cool. And they put it on and wear it to the ring for that match. So that you don't get more documentation than that. That's kind of wild. That's funny, you, you just told me, you said, I have another th piece with a great story, and I don't know which one I would grab if the house was burning between the robe and this. So tell us this story. Yeah, so hopefully, uh, you know, if you're at least a sports fan, even if you're not necessarily a racing fan, you probably recognize, like, this iconic hat that always kind of looks like a, a duck ran straight into the, you know, front of this cowboy hat. But this hat here is actually... Uh, a personal cowboy hat that was owned and worn by Richard Petty. Can you show us so, the inside and how yeah. you knew that? And so, yeah, being from North Carolina, if you look at all of his hats are made by a company called Charlie One Horse, and they they have a signature, but you can actually buy these at retail, except for the fact that right here on the band, it says made especially for Richard Petty. So this is definitely a custom model uh, for his head. So this hat actually came right off of Richard wow. Petty's head. So. And you told me that you had maybe the best Richard Petty story ever <laughs> when you went to his museum for your birthday. That's right, yeah. I was actually uh, coming back from uh, the Mooresville area. A lot of race teams are there. So I stopped by his uh, shop in uh, Level Cross. He has a garage there for a Petty's garage and his museum. And uh, so as I'm stopping by there, you can walk through, take tours. I think you've been there. I have. I loved um, it. Yeah, it's it's awesome just to kill a great afternoon. And there's a nice uh, lady that works up at the front, uh, Miss Bonnie, and was kind of chatting with her on this day. I mentioned to her it was my birthday. Uh, they never really indicate if the king is around or not. Um, there is a kind of inner office that's built in there where he goes and signs a lot of his, uh, you know, fan mail that he gets. Uh but, so I didn't really know if he was there or not. It was my birthday. Um, so then I was getting ready to leave and I asked about uh, going somewhere local to get lunch. Uh, and there's a place not too far from his shop there in Level Cross. So she recommended I go there. And she said, you know, um, I'd like a hot dog if you're willing to bring a hot dog back. And I said, sure, no problem. And then she says, you know, if you bring a hot dog back, uh, the king might make an appearance. So of course I'm gonna get a hot dog and bring it back. So <laughs> went there, ate, brought her a hot dog back and just a few minutes later, out comes uh, Richard Petty with, you know, full cowboy hat, the glasses, the whole deal, walks out and says, you know, happy birthday. And man, it just doesn't get any better than that. You're right there at the museum and the king's coming out wishing you happy birthday. That's pretty dang cool. That is great, man. And you are just such a nice guy. Um, I, you know, I've gotten to talk to you for quite a bit. You really deserve these items. You're a great custodian. You have a great uh, mentality behind the collection. And I just want to thank you for letting us come out and share it with everybody in the uh, in the world that may not ever get to see it somewhere. Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that, and I appreciate you coming and, and uh, taking the time to document this. I, I feel it's important we share it, for sure. The silhouette of the hat and everything behind he it. He signed this for you at the local college, and he's basically wearing your hat, the hat that you have there. That's awesome. Yep. Mm -hmm.